Amen. You may recognize a little bit of discomfort in myself this morning as my throat sounds more like coming from a frog than it does me. <laughs> uh, yes, I'm, I have the, the, the same kind of symptoms that Jenna has. Kara had, had experienced the same kind of thing. And uh, so I'm not going to escape it either. And so if I refrain from shaking your hand, please understand it's not because I'm trying to shun you, but I'm trying to protect you. All right. So as we look at uh, the fruit of the Spirit, the, next char- the characteristics of the fruit of the Spirit, and we look at long-suffering. Uh, you know, as our Father in Heaven, we, His children, uh, certainly we would, we would want to emulate our Father in Heaven. We would be, want to become like Him as much as we can. And same with our Savior, Jesus Christ, who also is God, that as, as Jesus left his example for us, and we see re- the Bible replete with example after example of God's long-suffering to his people, both in the Old Testament and in today, the New Testament as well. So as we think of the, the term, the fruit or that, that is of long-suffering, when we have joined the Lord in peace with God, then we have great patience with man. If you think about that we know the relationship we have with God, and we, know, we, we enjoy the blessings that he bestows upon Christians, that as we uh, consider that with that hope of everlasting life, and that looking forward to his son returning to the earth and, and delivering to, uh, uh, us up to the Father, uh, that uh, certainly that we look forward to that with joy, And because of that confidence we have in in that great gift he's given us, that we have great patience with men, realizing where we come from, that, you know, we uh, also were lost in sin at one time, but having been taught and learned for ourselves the consequences of sin, that we, all of us have sin, and that that only in, in finding forgiveness of God that we can have the, the peace that surpasses, per, surpasseth all understanding. And so, understanding that, we can have great patience with man. We can. Not all, not all the time that we do we, but, but uh, certainly we do, we do realize that just as God had been patient with us, so he's also patient with all others. As we consider to rejoice in the Lord always, again I will say rejoice, let your forbearance be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. In nothing be anxious, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall guard your hearts and your thoughts in Christ Jesus. That's Philippians 4, 4 through 7. But uh, let your forbearance be known unto all men. Exhibit it in such a way that they understand. They can see it. They can see it by example. Long-suffering enables us to endure hardships and much injury without provocation. Um, that is, when it, without, we are not provoked to lash out at others. We can endure, we can forbear, uh, regardless of how we might be treated. In fact, Thayer, you might be familiar with Thayer's lexicon um, of uh, Greek, the uh, New Testament Greek uh, terms. And uh, it's pretty extensive. And, uh, he has root, root words of the Greek language, and he has ex, ex, uh, well, and how each of the words, as in their derivatives, are used in the scriptures, and it gets pretty pretty in depth. And so, as he defines this term "long suffering" in this passage, to be of a long spirit, not to lose heart, to persevere patiently and bravely, and enduring misfortunes and troubles to be patient in bearing the offenses and injuries of others, to be mild and slow in, ang- in, in avenging, to be long-suffering, slow to anger, slow to punish. That's the idea of long-suffering. And, and of course, the, the, the term involves a lot of, of, we can imagine various scenarios where we, we, would, we would see how our resolve to exhibit long-suffering uh, plays an important role. And, and um, as we think about not only just how others treat us in general, and you know, 
even within our own family, whom we love dearly, when I say our own, own physical family, whom we love dearly, the, the blood relations, that uh, uh, sometimes we, we uh, are a little negligent in our treatment of our family members and or, or short with them or, or uh, you know, impatient with them. Um, and or we feel like they were not being treated with the due respect that we deserve. And so that's where our long suffering goes. And so with that familial relationship, but also our family in the family of God, as we consider, sometimes we respond in a way that's, that uh, wouldn't, it does not reflect the, the love of our Savior, you know. And, uh, but yet the long suffering of ourselves being treated like that, we endure it. We like say, it's just a passing thing, you know. But, uh, but especially those are in the world who aren't, don't have any inclination to be long-suffering. Uh, and, uh, and don't see a reason to be long-suffering. Uh, case and example, you call up for help service and whatever, whatever you need, and the guy on the other end is not very responsive to your needs. You recognize a failure in your appliance, and you need service quickly because you rely upon the appliance, and he just doesn't seem to be interested, so how do you respond? Well, you've heard the term, the, the squeaky wheel gets the, gets the grease, or squeaky wheel gets the oil. And so if you're the squeaky wheel, you make the noise so that you'll, you'll be, receive the appropriate uh, uh, response. And, you know, uh, being assertive is not necessarily being, being impatient. Recognizing that you're not getting the service that you, you deserve, there's nothing wrong with being assertive, but yet I think there's a way that you can go about it without being disrespectful. But as we think about the, in the everyday lives of people, they, they see they sometimes, they, they feel like they're justified and they have to be aggressive, not assertive, but aggressive to get the results they want. So the, that we consider that the world typically doesn't understand the long suffering, uh, except for when it comes to personal interests, I would say. Uh, you know, God has always been long suffering to man. Uh, Adam, could you read Exodus 34, verses 6 and 7? Interesting that, that as people turn away from God, turn to idols, and though in the Old Testament particularly, they turn to, to idols, that, uh, that they would involve themselves with sin, yet God was long-suffering, that uh, he was merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abundant in loving kindness. How long did it take? When Israel began to turn away from God to idols, how long was it before God uh, sent his wrath upon them? So when I, when I say wrath, first the Assyrians invaded the northern kingdom of Israel. How long was it that they had rejected God before God finally acted and fulfilled his promise? We can go back to Moses, and he, told, he warned the people that, basically promised the people that if they ever turned away from God, that God would remove them from the land. Well, you recall when Jeroboam became king, when the, when the kingdom split, when Rehoboam became king, and the kingdom split between north and south, the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah, in the northern kingdom, Jeroboam was, was the first king of Israel. And uh, he established a false religion that many people followed. And from that point on, I mean, we consider that, let's see if I can do a little arithmetic here. It was in, uh, I think it was about... Uh, About 900 B.C., Rehob Rehoboam came to power. I may be off of it by a few decades or so, but about 900 B.C. And then when the Assyrians came, that was, uh, that was 722 B.C. So between 900 B.C. and 722, that's 178 years. About 178 years that God allowed Israel 
to go off and, uh, and worship their idols and do all of these things. And so as we think of the long-suffering of God, he didn't bring immediate judgment upon them. Rather, he waited for them. Unfortunately, uh, none of the kings in Israel were righteous. None of them followed after the ways of David, and they continued to follow their, uh, their idols and, worship and bow down before them and, and, and make offerings in the groves and on the high places. And so finally, God took matters. And, and also later on, it was 606 when Judah had become so evil, had departed from God basically, that he brought his wrath upon them too, that brought the Babylonians in to uh, invade. Oh, so we look at, consider the long suffering of God toward man. This is, these are just two examples. We can look at individual examples too about how God being long suffering with man. The great prophet Jeremiah paid tribute to God's long suffering as he wrote in uh, Jeremiah 15 15. Can someone read Jeremiah 15 15? So as, as Jeremiah was giving uh, attention to God's long suffering, and Jeremiah, of course, he was a prophet to to the uh, to the God's people in, in, Ju in Judah, warning them of uh, the up the upcoming <coughs> exile they would they would suffer, and nobody believed him. And in fact, they didn't just not believe Jeremiah, rather they were actively uh, persecuting him. Um, and so as Jeremiah was be suffering through these persecution, he would say, avenge me of my persecutors. But he says, take me not away in thy long suffering. So you, we know that God knows. We go to the book of Hebrews and, and, and uh, learn how God not only brings calamity upon those like the day of judgment, oh, I should say the, 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 the day of the flood, when uh, God commissioned Noah to build the ark and uh, waited a hundred years as Noah was building the ark. And uh, uh, actually when he announced it, it was 120 years. And as Noah was constructing the ark, his, himself being a righteous preacher was preaching to the, those people that day to repent because God was going to destroy the world. And they didn't. But throughout all this, finally God brought the floods, destroyed the, the entire world with water, but delivered Noah and his family and the animals on the ark uh, from, the, from the, that treacherous world that they had come into. So God knows how to deliver the righteous in the midst of his wrath upon the evil. <clears throat> Look at 2 Peter 3.15. 2 Peter 3.15. Kara, can you read that? And count as the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul also, according to the wisdom given to him, wrote unto you. Okay. So as we think about, let's see, that God in his long suffering, that his delay of the last day is giving more and more people opportunity to to uh, repent of their sins and turn to God. I should say, turn to God and repent of their sins. Okay. And to find salvation that, is, that God so freely gives. But that as, as those people at Peter, to whom Peter was reading, Peter was uh, preparing them mentally, emotionally, for the coming tribulation that they would suffer, the persecutions they would suffer. And so he was giving them encouragement and the reason for that they should endure and then in, in the last part, in verse 15, and the long-suffering of the Lord is salvation. The fact that, that God was not going to end the world real soon, it's giving more and more people to, to uh, find everlasting life. You know, it's, uh, we know that uh, there are no signs 
of the Lord's return. He will come as a thief in the night. And that uh, uh, when he comes, it will be a big surprise for many people. To those who are prepared, it won't be a surprise because they'll be expecting him. And, uh, but those who are expecting him are looking forward to that eternal reward. And so it would be reasonable to, to look forward to re- the return of Christ. And as we think about the reward and the, uh, and the fulfillment of the promise of, he- of the heavenly realm being fulfilled on that day, would not the Christian look forward with anticipation for that day to come? In fact, I wonder how many people are looking so forward to it they wish it would come tomorrow. You know? or, or have we become complacent in that knowing there are no signs, and it's been almost 2,000 years since Jesus ascended into heaven, that we're wondering, well, it's probably not going to happen in my lifetime. That's generally the attitude, I would think. I mean, that, that Jesus is not going to come in my lifetime. But yet, we don't have that promise, do we? In fact, we're warned that in the day that we least expect, Jesus will come. Okay. And so, we should be prepared looking for that day, as, as the scripture teaches, to watch and pray. But as we think about God is putting the day off, I say, I don't know if he's putting the day off so much, but it seems like it's a long time. And the fact that God is long-suffering, giving more people time for salvation, to find salvation. Okay. Uh, and as I spoke about earlier in Noah's day, that Paul, Peter also reminds us that God was long-suffering in Noah's day. Look at 1 Peter 3.20. Uh, can someone read First Peter three twenty? So God was patient in those days, waiting, and and as. as Noah was building the ark, and finally came, the time came. But as God had announced to Noah, there'd be 120 years, and he would destroy mankind. Okay. So as we think about, as children of God, we, too, must be long-suffering. As we think about the, the fruit of the Spirit, and that characteristic being long-suffering, and as I mentioned earlier in the, in the, in the a few weeks ago, these characteristics are natural products of living in the Spirit, living according to the Spirit. Uh, it's, it's what comes by when we focus upon living in a spiritual life rather than a fleshly life. And so it's just natural that we would be long-suffering. However, sometimes there are things that we need to uh, attend to and give effort for. As we think about, uh, let's see. I think it's 2 Peter chapter 1, uh, verse 5. As Peter is giving them instructions and preparing them for the persecutions that were to come, and, and Peter, first, or 2 Peter verse, chapter 1, verse 5, And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. Okay, so we see that this is something that the Christian himself must attend to and working on. And as he says in verse 8, For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So there are aspects of the spiritual walk that we, and our personal characteristics that we give attention to and work on in our own lives. And as we look at long-suffering, sometimes it's not so convenient to be long-suffering. And so sometimes we have to remind ourselves, I'm walking in the spirit. I'm going to be long-suffering. Ephesians 4, verse 2. Can someone read Ephesians 4, verse 2? I'll be right back in a moment. Okay. 
So, Ephesians 4, verse 2. Actually, go back, go back to the beginning of chapter four. Of what does he be? What does the he begin with this thought of Ephesians four verse one? Adam. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of your calling, which you were called, with all holiness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love. Okay, so it's regarding our calling. You know, the the the, the gospel teaches us to change our ways, repent of our sins, and to change our ways and these characteristics should be uh, part of our life. Look at uh, Colossians 1.11. In fact, let's see here. Verses 9 through 11. Who can read Colossians 1, 9 through 11? For this reason we also since that day do not cease to pray for you. And to ask you to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all things, in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. That you may walk So as we are, are uh, walking worthily in the Lord, that we be strengthened with the might according to his glorious power, and to all patience and long-suffering with joyfulness. And so that as an aspect or characteristic of the fruit of the Spirit, that we would be filled with that, that we would exhibit that. So uh, Colossians 3.12, last verse that we'll look at this morning, Colossians 3.12 I like the way that it turns. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering. That term, bowels of mercies, is a term that we don't really use today. But as we talk about issues of the heart, what do we talk about? When we talk about things of the heart, what do we usually mean in our current, our current vernacular? Hmm? Emotions. The emotions. And so there are issues of the heart. Why? The, the blood pumping uh, mechanism that God has put in our, in our body to move uh, nutrients and oxygen throughout our body. Is that what we're talking about? Issues of the heart? No, we're talking about, we're referring to a body part that, char- that we associate characteristics of, a, of, a, of something else entirely, an emotional characteristic. Okay. So as we consider issues of the heart, the issues of the emotions, you know, love, hate, all these things. And when he, the term bowels of mercy is another vernacular in that day and time. These bowels of mercy, we think of our bowels in our innards and in our abdomen, right? But the bowels of mercies is referenced to as it is mercies. And they associate it with a, the, a, bod, bo, uh, an, a, a part of the body. And, and it makes sense if you think about it. When we are extremely emotionally moved, do we not get a sense of, of uh, di- or discomfort or wheeziness or something c- coming stemming from our abdomen? You know, when we talk about, uh, is when there are extreme emotional aspects, or there are extreme awe, love, appreciation, all these, any of these things, do we not get a sense of a body reaction in, in, in our abdomen? So the idea of Bowels of mercy fits completely, perfectly with that. So as um, 
<coughs> as we consider that forbearing one another and forgiving one another, if any man have, well, that's wrong. Okay. The bowels of mercy. Uh, okay. That's a different verse. I'm, I'm called out Colossians 3.12, but I read a different verse altogether. Okay. 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 So 12. Put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. So it goes along with that long-suffering, as we should have an attitude of... Instead of tearing somebody else's throat out, we should be uh, passive in that sense. Uh, that we don't lash out, strike out. As a matter of fact, when I, I can, we consider it to be attitudes where we're uh, instructed that if a, if, a, if a man strike us in our cheek, turn the other cheek to give him to, so he can strike the other cheek. That if we're compelled to carry a soldier's pack a mile, go with him two miles. That's called going the extra mile, uh, as a matter of fact. In, uh, in that day and age, it was by law, a Roman officer could, or soldier could compel someone to carry his pack, but no more than a mile. Okay? That was lawful, and that was not considered undue burden. That was just the law. So you, you would aid the Roman Empire by carrying soldiers' packs if he so compelled you to. But Jesus said, well, you, can see, you can imagine the, uh, uh, the response of many Jews saying oh, to, to the Roman Empire. They didn't want the Roman Empire in there, and yet they were there, and they were in control, and they were, in many cases, well, most cases, they were rather oppressive. And so the fact that they were demanded, it's like the, the fact that they're demanded to, to uh, carry that pack was uh, rather offensive. It's, I would imagine, like in the days of the colonies when the, uh, toward the, the uh, uh, beginning of the revolution, that uh, the, the law, the king's law would require that the colonists uh, provide room and board for the, the British soldiers. Okay. And so as the Americans thought this was so offensive because it, imp it was impressing, imposing upon us, and that's why that that uh, that uh, <coughs> articles in our constitution that won't will not be the case. We will not allow that. Uh, but as you think of it, Jesus said, "Don't just carry the pack for one mile. Go the second mile." Of course, the mile is a is a measure that we're familiar with. I'm not sure what the mile with the measurement they used in in the the uh, Greek language, but the the idea being the same. Um, so long suffering and forbearing. And so as we might look at the uh, Beatitudes and, and uh, think about all the ways that people would impose themselves upon us. And we're not told to retaliate, but rather to supply a service. Um, It all begins, um, I say it all begins, it all begins with chapter 5, verse 1. Talking about those that are blessed in God and that the blessings that come from their behavior and their attitudes. But in verse 11 it says, Blessed are ye when men re shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted the prophets which were before you. 
Um, ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt had lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It's henceforth good for nothing, but to be cast out, to be trodden underfoot of men. What's he warning them about? If they're the salt of the earth, and they're to behave in such a way, <coughs> they give seasoning to the presence on this earth, if it loses its ability to flavor the food, what good is that salt? What do you do with salt that doesn't taste good anymore? Well, they would take it out and they'd throw it on the, on the roads to kill all the weeds so that they'd have good pathways to walk upon. And so that was its only worthwhile purpose, so they'd throw this tasteless salt on the roads that would kill all the weeds and grass and any, any uh, vegetation so they would have a clear path. And it was good for nothing but to be trodden under by men rather than to be used for seasoning for flavoring their food. And so he's warning those who would follow after him, his disciples, if you lose your ability to flavor life, to be a good example to others, to show forth uh, the, the, uh, the goodness of God, what are you good for? Nothing in God's purpose. That's what he's warning them about. Um, in verse 14, you're the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. And so as we are to let our light so shine before men, verse 16, that they may see the, our good works and glorify our God, Father which is in heaven. That's the point. And so with that backdrop about showing forth the goodness of God, letting our light shine that may glorify God, our Father in heaven, therefore, when you go on, he gives the various examples of how we show forth our light in spite of how, of how people will treat us. Um, uh, let's see here. Um, so as I, we look at uh, verse uh, 38 of chapter 5. Ye have heard that it hath been said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say unto you that ye resist not evil. Don't put, your out there, put, don't put yourself out there to be a target of evil. But whosoever shall smite thee in thine, on thy right cheek, turn to him the other also. Don't bust him over the, over the head because he smacked you. Don't elevate things. Show forth God's light. Show forth your light to glorify God. Um, verse 40, And if any man shall sue thee at law, and take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. This is providing a service forth your, your love for whomever would hate you. You're showing forth your light to glorify the Father in heaven. And verse 41, and whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him twain. Go two miles. Give to him that asketh thee, and from him that would borrow thee, turn not thou away. In verse 43, and 44 summarizes the whole point. Ye have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, Love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. And pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. And the result, that ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. For he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and the unjust. So that's, that's the whole point in that as we think about not lashing out and not retaliating, but rather doing good to those who are doing us harm, we're showing forth our light to glorify the Father in heaven. And as we think about, as that associated with long-suffering, does it not take long-suffering on our part to be able to do this? And, you know, I think the re end result is, that as they see you, why is he doing that? Why is he or she being so kindly? What's in it for her? Why are they doing, you know? And so they ask the question, and they might ask you, why are you doing this? Why are you so polite and gentle with me as, as harshly as I've treated you? You know, and say, because my Lord told me to. That I should love everyone. And certainly that would be an attraction. This is the Christian life. I don't I didn't do anything. <laughs> this is the Christian life. That 
as hard as it might be, but as we walk in the Spirit, it's a natural fruit that falls with it. And yes, okay, let me say natural fruit. If we have been walking in the Spirit, it is natural that it would occur, but it doesn't mean that there's no effort involved with resolving ourselves to be this way. Long, be long suffering. After all, God has been so long suffering to all. And uh, as we as his children should reflect and uh, exhibit those same characteristics. Any thoughts or questions about what we discussed this morning? Yeah. And we are all salt is also a preservative. Mm-hmm. So we as Christians can preserve this world from moral decay. Now we can't create physical decay, obviously, but um, so we can be a sustainer of good in this world. Yes. We can well apply our influence in the right places. And I think showing that long suffering, kindness, gentleness, meekness is a way of softening. Okay. Our I think of Abraham when, uh, when God came to him for, and announced that he was going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah and the plain cities. What did Abraham do? Wait, wait, wait. What if there are 50 righteous men in that city? You're going to destroy them to get with them too? What if there are 50 men? Would you, would you not spare the cities for the life of 50 righteous men? God said, yeah, okay. I'll spare it for 50 men. Well, what about 40 would you spare for 40? What about 30? And of course, he's, he's working down. So what if you find just 10 righteous men of all these plain cities? Say there were, oh, I don't know how big the cities were. They were probably pretty, pretty big. But if there were 10,000 people in each of the villages or the cities, and there'd be 50,000 people, that's a very conservative estimate, I would think, about the day. In those days, how many people were citizens of those cities? So if you found just 10 people out of 50,000, won't you spare them all? And what God said? Yeah, okay, I will. It's a testament to how wicked those cities were and the fact that he didn't find just 10 men who were righteous. But, but as we see that God, as you were talking about being the salt of the earth and being uh, having this... Uh, preserving na- uh, characteristics in that, in our, as we, exp- you know, we have love, joy, peace, patience, long-suffering, steadfastness, long-suffering. And as it was a seasoning upon this earth, a seasoning the life on this earth, that God sees that, and I'm, I, it seems because of the events in Sodom and Gomorrah that he, and other examples where God spared people that for the sake of those that fear him, it seemed like what you're, what you're talking about. As we, and, and of course, ideally, I think it, associated with the fact that we show forth our light to glorify our Father, this is an aspect of it. You know. I think that applies to the way of the world. Yeah. Because there are those who still have that opportunity yes. to uh, fight the battle and to be saved. And you know, he doesn't want anyone to perish. Yeah. And I think that drives us, that, that seems to drive his long suffering. Yeah. You think about okay. You think about God's main purpose in this world is to save everybody. That's what God wants. That's what God wants ultimately. And as His children, we would also want that same thing. So as we would do things to try to save more souls, that it would would it be too much to ask of us if we just treat others kindly? regardless of how they treat us, because it might be their last chance. It might be their very last chance to ever have an opportunity to find salvation through us. We might be that last hope that they have. So is it too much for for God to ask of us to be kind to others, to be uh, uh, long-suffering with them? Uh, That as we go about doing his will, and his will is to save others, 
in following after the Lord's will, we would gladly persevere with these qualities, these rich qualities to help others be saved. Well, that's the class for this morning. I appreciate your attention and questions and comments. And uh, next week we'll go to the next, next term on this and uh, continue on with the study. Thank you.